Monday and Tuesday we have A, B, and B, C. And if we find out that the ship that's composed at the very end, what's it called? It's uh, FL. If FL follows the same sailing schedule as A, B, then you can say that that's essentially the same ship, uh, even though it's constituted by different parts. So, um, so yeah, it's ev it evolves and it follows the same scaling, sailing schedule, just like the train follows the same train schedule. Okay, um, he makes a few clarifications. He says that saying something is used in a loose and popular sense does not mean that it's incorrect. Uh, because it's used, things are used in this sense uh, every day by people. I'm going to take the, you know, I'm taking the same train that I took last year, even though you're not taking, you know, the identical train. So in some ways, you know, it's a lot of this stuff of like what we mean by same in a loose and popular sense is actually defined by us. It's, it's set by the conventions that we come up with. And he says that he says, you know, saying something is the same in a philo strict and philosophical sense, or something is identical to is defined by the dictionary makers. The dictionary makers set the parameter for what, what it means for something to be the same, but to say that something constitutes the same thing uh, is something that's decided by us and by the conventions that we adopt. Um, he says that all objects described are identical to themselves, so that just means that AB equals AB, FL equals FL, things like that, which you know most philosophers are going to grant that that's a necessary truth. Um, he made the philosophical point, he says, in a strict sense, nothing can be the same with that which it has nothing in common. So there at least has to be, that goes back to his sort of evolution example. Uh, he also gives the example of a riverbed, right? He talks about the sin. I think it was Thomas Aquinas or somebody that made this point. Um, how can we say that the sin is the same river that it was, you know, uh, in the fall that it is in the spring? Because the water is completely changed. Well, he says the two things are, it flows in the same direction, it comes from the same source. So, and that's, you know, those are just sort of conventions that we've decided on, that we've decided to call this thing the sin, even though it's not qualitatively identical. Different water constitute the, constitutes the sin at different times. So finally, he finishes up by saying, so this, these are the things, you know, we have the ships, we've got the trains, and we've got rivers, those are things. And we can say in a loose and popular way that those are the same things. But we can't say that they're identical in a strict and philosophical sense. However, uh, with people, he thinks that we have to say, if we say that somebody is the same person, you know, I'm the same person I was 10 years ago, we're not talking about a loose and popular sense. We're talking about a strict and philosophical sense. And he gives several criteria for why that is the case. Uh, he says, if somebody asks us the question, uh, are you the same person that you were before? Am I the same person I was 10 years ago? There has to be a yes or no answer given to that. It can't be sort of this, um, you know, it's decided by interpretation. People decide, well, he's the same person, he's not the same person. It's, it's not the same. Um, and the question becomes, he said, you know, what does it even mean for us to say that we're not the same people? You know, we use this all the time in a loose and popular sense to say that, you know, uh, well, he had, you know, he found God or whatever, or, you know, he went through a profound uh, experience and he's just not the same person that he was before. Uh, but we mean that in a loose and popular sense when we say that. We don't mean that this person is like, you know, entirely their, you know, their entire persona has changed. Everything about them has changed. We usually, we don't mean that. It's hard to make sense out of that. And finally, he, he gives an example that was provided by a famous uh, pragmatist philosopher named Charles Peirce. And Peirce uses this example to try to show that it doesn't make sense to think about identity, personal identity, in a loose and popular sense. And the, I, the example is a surgery example. So you go in to have a surgery, and there are two criteria that you're making your decision about which case to choose in the surgery. The criteria that you're concerned with, one, is financial so you want to do what costs, what's the most cost effective, and the other is pain, or avoidance of pain, right? You want to do the thing that's going to minimize the pain. So in the first scenario, you can go in and you can pay a lot of money and um, get anesthesia and you won't feel the pain, you'll go to sleep and you'll wake up and you won't even really have any memory of the pain. The second example is much weirder. 
So you go in and uh, you're not going to have anesthesia. So this one definitely satisfies the cheaper criteria. But what they do is they're going to give you a pill that's going to make you, when you're getting operated on, it's going to make you forget everything. Everything that made you the person you were when you walked into that operating room is going to be gone. And then so it's almost like a new person has come into existence. And that person is going to be operated on and is going to be in incredible pain. And But once the surgery is over, uh, you're going to be given another pill that's going to make you forget sort of all of the pain that you went through, but it's going to sort of return your memories as well. So like, let's say this first drug that you take is temporary. It makes you temporarily forget who you are. A new person arises out of that. And then once you wake up, sort of your memories of who you are actually come back, but your memory of the surgery is completely wiped out. And Peirce asks us to consider which, which case we would prefer, and he thinks that most people are going to say, you know, well, that's probably going to be me that's in pain. Uh, even though I've taken this drug and somebody's going to suffer, and if it's not me, who is it? And Peirce gives us an example to sort of try to show that we can't really make sense of this idea of being different people at different times in a strict and philosophical sense. So that was the first uh, piece we looked at. The second thing we looked at is a really, uh, really important philosophical article by a guy who he's actually still alive. His name's Saul Kripke. He's, he's done some really important stuff in philosophy of language. And uh, this piece was on contingent identity statements. And the reason this is important is because most of the time when we think of identity statements, we think that they're necessarily true. So, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is an identity statement. Um, and we think that that's necessarily true. But, you know, Kripke wants to show that contingent identity statements are also uh, possible. So... Yeah, we started off talking about modal logic a little bit. You know, it's this idea of possible worlds. So there are three sort of statements. There's one, something is necessarily true, means that it's true in all possible worlds. And the, the idea of a possible world there, or 